So we have been fascinated with organ regeneration since the beginning of times. And uh, we have been doing in medicine uh, through time a lot of uh, challenges and we have been inventing things that made sense and didn't make sense and we have always have been trying to regenerate and substitute portions on, on our bodies to cure disease and the promise that I see happening is that one day we're not going to have long lists of uh, transplants, of, of waiting for transplants because we're going to know how to fix our own organs and that is what um, a lot of scientists are focusing on. I was talking to some group last night and uh, we were talking about how the pattern of disease has changed in the past 60 years due to what we eat, what we drink, what we breathe, and uh, what we're doing to Mother Earth. Um, in the past 60 years there have been a shift of disease towards degenerative and autoimmune conditions and that is our bodies reacting to everything that we do wrong to Mother Earth and to ourselves. Fortunately, we have always been, like I said, trying to figure out ways to regenerate and um, the stem cell words that, and I, and I say this is like the sexy word of the past 15 years, everybody's talking about stem cells, stem cells. The reality is that we're not really doing stem cell treatments at per se, we're doing cellular therapies. Everything begins with a cell, the, a cell is the minimal um, living um, unit that's capable of replicating independently and you have somatic cells and you have gametes and then you have stem cells and like I said the buzzword but what's in a, what's in a cell what's in the name like Shakespeare what's in a cell that makes us uh, that allows us to call it a stem cell it has to be able to self it has to be undifferentiated it has to be able to self renew and it has to express potency, not only has to be undifferentiated, it has to be able to differentiate in several tissues. Um, there is, we, that we talk a lot about mesenchymal cells and the, the, the very uh, stemness of these cells is in argument, but we're not gonna go academic on this. Uh, you, have a one, you had a wonderful academic presentation yesterday. Um, so basically these cells are healers and we're going to use them as such. These are types of very loose um, classification of the types of stem cells and I'm going to go over uh, some of them real quick. Just to have an idea when we talk about cellular medicine what we have in a product and why do we expect this product to do something. So we have the embryonic cells, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, mesenchymal cells, hematopoietic endothelial progenitors, umbilical vein endothelial cells, and the famous mus and B cells, uh, controversial kind of question. Now the embryonic stem cells are the cells that come, that are uh, obtained from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst. These are cells that are in the lab. Uh, they're, they're, they're being used as models for uh, treatment for conditions and to model certain conditions that we can um, pre predict um, at, at one point when is it going to develop and when not. And uh, important thing, well, these cells are have unlimited growth in culture and. Uh, they're associated with a lot of times they say oh the stem cells because they can grow cancer well this is the stem cell that really can it's related to the growth of tumors especially in the in culture now the induced pluripotent stem cells are a work of genius he Dr. Shinja Yamanaka um, earned the Nobel Prize in 20, the Nobel Prize in medicine in 2012 and that's because this guy, this guy came up with a wonderful idea of getting a fibroblast and make it into an embryonic cell. 
by deprogramming, by infecting the culture with the virus and so on. So now we have a cell that's pluripotent and it's customized to, there's, there's no chance of immune rejection and, and so on. So he's been doing He's been doing several clinical trials. He had to actually suspend a couple of them because these cells are kind of um, genetically um, unstable. But they're working on it, on, on this, and this, these cells are a lot, they have to do a lot with the future of regenerative medicine. Now the hematopoietic stem cells, we talk a lot about them, we talk a big game because we have been working with these guys for the past 50 years. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the first times that the word, the, the buzz concept stem cell was mentioned was in 1908. Um, the Russian scientist Alexander Maximov presented his unitary theory of hematopoiesis to the um, Hematology College of London and what he said was basically all these guys look so much alike that they have to come from a mother, common mother cell. Well, that's, that was the, he didn't know much that he was talking about the hematopoietic stem cell. Um, the first time that we did an actual stem cell treatment in medicine was in 1968. And basically that's what it is. Uh, we're trying to regenerate tissue using progenitor cells, and that's what we're doing. Um, this is a wonderful cell. It's an upregulator of the production of the vascular endothelial growth factor, and it actually, it's actually a healer when it's uh, circulating in blood. The bad news is that this cell, the amount of these cells decreases with time uh, on peripheral blood. And they're very plastic, they can actually differentiate in, in several uh, tissue in, in vitro. They're a very uh, cool, powerful healer cell. Like I said, unfortunately we don't have that many as we grow older, we have less and less of them circulating in blood. And there is a dramatic fall around 65 years old. On, on the amount of CD34 cells that, uh, hematopoietic cells that we have circulating in blood. So that goes for, we try not to, um, we, we kind of choose to use uh, peripheral blood treatments in, in the areas that where we, where we have it available, not to use uh, that type of treatment on elderly because we have less count of cells. Uh, the mesenchymal cells, we talk, Dr. Gavik talk a lot about them. These are located in the microvasculature. Uh, they're called also octopus-like cells because they're surrounding the blood vessels. And these guys are basically, they pick up information, they transmit information, they're adherent, uh, means they stick to everything that's plastic which is important uh, in the clinic because you don't want to leave a uh, product standing there on a syringe because you will lose cells uh, treatment. They can be, they differentiate into mesodermal lines, that's one of the characteristics that uh, defines them, but they don't do that in vivo. They do that in vitro um, and that's that's actually forced to, to, to guarantee that this is a, a mesenchymal stem cell culture. They work through paracrine effect and the functions are mostly trophic, immunomodulatory and anti, uh, antimicrobial. They release all this bunch of good stuff and they're capable of re-establishing the microenvironment in the, um, in the area. Whether we pull them out or whether, whether there is an injury to a tissue, they wake up, they start signaling to bring in more guys and they start releasing all the good stuff to produce healing. Uh, the endothelial progenitor cells are also, you can find them circulating in blood and these cells uh, lately have been used as a marker of disease prognosis or and disease progression. Uh, the more 
EPCs you have circulating in blood in a patient with a chronic degenerative condition, the better the prognosis, the, very, the better the possible outcome. Um, the less you have, the darker is the prognosis. There have been a few clinical trials using culture expanded um, endothelial progenitor cells. Um, the problem is that the results have been kind of limited and not long lasting. And these cells apparently are kind of difficult to culture and expand successfully. But when they're, you find them in view, especially you find a lot of them in umbilical cord blood, these guys repair endothelium. And they create new vasculature. And it's already been established when you have blood flow, you have regeneration. That's as simple as it gets. Um, so you have autologous treatments and allogenic treatment. And, and I am not going to be, we talked about regulations yesterday and it bothers me. I don't want to be talking, just refraining from saying this is available and this is not. We're talking medicine here, so it's known that there are certain things that in the U.S. you can not do or whatever, but they are being used on patients everywhere else. So, in the uh, autologous sources, you know, we have bone marrow. Bone marrow is a, it's a primary source in, in, in clinic, and it's a very, very easy, very straightforward procedure. And it can be administered uh, intravenously, intraarterially, um, intraarticularly, intraperitoneal, anywhere you want. You just filter it, and it goes. Stromovascular fraction from adipose tissue, it takes a process, um, but it also has uh, yields a very decent amount of regenerative cells. The peripheral blood mononuclear layer, um, and, and uh, this product usually, I, I see that in Russia they use it a lot. And what they do is they gather these mononuclear uh, cells and they kind of culture expand them before giving it to the patient. Immunotherapy and culture expanded autologous, there, there's also the possibility. Your cells are yo as young as they are today. So a lot of people tend to get their own cells, do a treatment, and get some more for culture expansion and future cryopreservation. Uh, allogenic, you can get uh, mesenchymal cells from any other any source, and and they can be given to actually anybody. We talk about that those cells are immunosilent and immunomodulatory. Um, mesenchymal stem cells from the Wharton's jelly. Um, we have available amniotic fluid, amniotic membranes, and you have tissue-specific culture cells, and obviously um, umbilical cord blood products. Now, um, I was saying, I was telling you guys about cellular therapies, and that's cell-based therapy. That's what we're doing. In in any in any uh, case, even when we do a PRP, when we do a stromovascular fraction, when we do a bone marrow aspirate, when we get a vial from umbilical cord blood, we're doing a cellular therapy. It's not a stem cell therapy, even though you have progenitor. A whole bunch of regenerative and anti-inflammatory in essence. So um, platelet-rich plasma, it has a very heterogeneous mix of cells, especially when you do an LPRP. Um, if you do a peripheral blood, you have lymphocytes, monocytes, dendritic cells, um, hematopoietic cells, endothelial cells. Um, the famous very small embryonic like stem cells. So all that you you have all that mix of cells, and then with the bone marrow concentrate. And I want you to to listen to this. Uh, there is a lot of cellular types that are found in every one of the sources available for autologous treatment. 
If you have a stromal vascular fraction, you also have lymphocytes, you have uh, parasites, you have fibroblasts, and so on, and then you have pretty much the same in the bone marrow concentrate. So at the point where we already figured out that we have a heterogeneous mix of cells and uh, that uh, every product that we're you doing, it doesn't only contain stem cells, but it contains a different, type, different types of cells. Now we start fi trying to figure out, okay, which is best for my patient. And, uh, and it comes to the point where you figure that there is a numbers game. The more you, w the older we get, the more need for repair we have, and the autologous supply decreases. So you figure, okay, then if we have cells that are young, naive, that are ready to work, that haven't been in contact with any antigen, that are full of growth factors, and I can get them from a vial in a box, uh, probably it would be a good decision. I'm not saying it by no means, and I'm going to show you a lot of uh, our work in Cancun, and we've, we're used, we have been using autologous cells for a long time. So it's kind of, we mix in protocols, we mix uh, all the sources that we have available, but you have in a vial cells that are young, that are full of growth factors, that are ready to live longer because they have high viability. Um, so it's a powerful, powerful uh, weapon of choice. So what do you have in there? You have a bunch of bioactive molecules that uh, Dr. Gavitt discussed yesterday and a lot of different types of cells. And again, these are the cells in a vial. This is the umbilical cord blood product, but then if you look at what you have in bone marrow, you have pretty much give and take the same. And in stromal vascular fraction, you have give and take the same cells and the same type of uh, bioactive molecules. So, so, use this. The most important thing is that we have to create a clinical framework meaning we have to know the condition that we're going to treat inside and out and we have to know each one of those cells what do they do and what are we expecting them to do in what period of time and and we're at the point where we're trying to figure out how many cells per kg of body weight and it's it's a little bit kind of we're trying one million per kilo, two million per kilo, it, it kind of goes in that, um, in that range. There is a really beautiful paper, and, and it's an ongoing clinical trial that's being done at the University of Miami. Uh, they're using um, allogenic mesenchymal stem cells on f patients with frailty, el elderly patients with frailty. And they have been playing with doses. And actually, one of the groups where they gave, they gave like, I wanna say it was four million per kg of body weight, didn't do as well as the group where they gave two million. They're trying to figure out why. Because we will figure, okay, the more mesenchymal cells they have, the better it is. Well, they have a group that didn't do so well. Even though across the board the results were beautiful. So anyway, I'm going to tell you this again. This, what, what's coming is what can be done, not necessarily in the U.S. So, because um, a lot of the protocols that we're going to be talking about do not fall into the non-systemic homologous category of the FDA. But we do it outside. So anyway, the packaging on this, uh, on this product 
comes identified with uh, its own unique serial number and uh, all the contents are sterile until obviously it's opened. Um, it's important that we will see inside a, a report of uh, viability and such. It's important to add that to the patient's record with the number, the certificate of analysis in. Well, we saw this little bottle yesterday, uh, and we have two today. Margaret probably is going to see them and say, ha, I made this. This is one of my kids. Um, so basically, these are the instructions. You just grab it. I mean, it comes on dry eyes, so you have to wear gloves to get it out. <coughs> and we're just going to hold it in the palm of our hands until it's in complete liquid form. Now, it comes in a in 2 ml presentation. A lot of times, for example, if you're going to do a cell assist assisted fat transfer, and you're going to use this, or you're going to do a knee, or you want to cover a wound and, and it's, a, it's an, a wide area, might as well dilute it. You can dilute it with a saline solution just to get to the amount that might be reasonable to cover a specific area. Um, today we're going to do the two mLs in the knee. I, I feel like I usually what I do is I add one mL to do um, a big joint and if you have a small joint then you just pull the two mLs and just go um, into the small joints. Um, it has to be done obviously using sterile technique and the sample it's important should be injected two hours <coughs> within two hours of thawing. The most frequent clinical application of the cellular based products are uh, for musculoskeletal conditions, uh, static applications, especially scar management and um, lipotransfer, cell assisted um, fat transfer, breast reconstruction and skin rejuvenation. Fortunately, unfortunately, Ms. Paola is not here today, but we did a couple of months ago. And we had, we were looking at the before and afters last night, and it's cool and significant. Erectile dysfunction, pulmonary condition, especially COPD. I don't know what the COPD went up there. <laughs> it's not like they're not associated anyway. Um, central nervous system conditions. We have a we have a running uh, a trial in Cancun with autism, and uh, the hospital. As a matter of fact, the hospital was authorized by the Mexican FDA to do a cerebral palsy program. But then we kind of, the doctors in there kind of got like an extra permit to do the autism trial and we're ga gathering, I'm going to show you a couple of cases here. Um, and then autoimmune disorders. Autoimmune disorders, especially, especially uh, rheumatoid arthritis, we have been more successful treating. Um, lupus has been okay. Now, again, it's important to choose the, pa the patient wisely, like for anything. And a lot of times, <laughs> I tell this to the doctors that come uh, for training, and I go like, this might sound bad, but take it with a grain of salt. Choose the patient that's going to make you look good. And I'm not saying it in a cynical way. If you have an 87-year-old patient um, for, with frailty and a Parkinson's diagnosis of 20 years ago, you have very high chances that this is not going to work on them. And you have a smoker, a chronic smoker. Seriously? It's not like... So this patient is not going to... A plastic surgeon would not 
do a, a, a surgery on somebody that's a smoker at least they tell them you have to stop smoking for a month before because then you have this disease and disease of wounds and all sorts of complications that's basically the same you know if you have patient with a high of a bioxidative level and a toxic environment altogether these cells are not going to be enough and I by principle if you if I have a smoker and I'm not saying the social smoker which is wrong too but like this sm smoker two three packs a day for the past 10 years it's not even worth it they have to stop smoking because the level of oxidative damage these guys have it's it's beyond comprehension so anyway I got carried away with that um, so the inclusion criteria basically everybody that gives consent if does not have the exclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria is very specific first of all if you don't sign an informed consent you don't do anything on them but not, not only cellular therapy anything um, patients with a diagno diagnosis of a malignant neoplasia except for a BCC or so um, except for those that have no evidence of relapse in the last five years uh, if this patient is having a crisis in the condition it's on control it's not a good idea to uh, pick this patient for treatment obviously patients with history of alcohol drugs and smoker if we're going to do a joint previous bacterial joint infection recent bacterial joint infection it might not be uh, the ideal situation patients obviously an organ transplant list people with unrealistic expectations about outcomes in the physician's opinion that goes you put in there anything if it gives you a bad vibe no because some people um, expect you to be Lazarus I mean God and Lazarus so no and then non-treatable conditions and there are non-treatable conditions with cellular therapies so risks there is always risks with any medical procedure from an intramuscular injection to cellular therapy <coughs> the um, unwanted effects are very uh, few uh, but they can be and, and there might be actual incontrollable events those are very rare I can let me knock on wood I have been doing this for the past 10 years I started with autologous and I still do a lot of autologous and a lot of different cellular types and types and culture expanded cells and so on and I have never had a complication ever so I'm in a good streak right now but these things have happened and usually happen like pain and um, the flu-like symptoms that's something that's very common and a lot of patients get really scared because they start uh, shaking uncontrollably and they have some joint pain and that's something that's going to go away with hydration and pre-medication I'm going to talk about the pre-medication um, and then allergic reactions that could happen now we were talking about the DMSO yesterday now where are we, what were the techniques for reintegration you could do local delivery and local delivery um, means intraperitoneal, intramuscular, intracardiac, intraticular you just in, directly in the wound you just deliver it where you expect them to be and then the systemic route the intravenous and intraterial I am adding uh, their um, intrathecal because intrathecal is covering uh, more than one uh, system so that could be considered a systemic way to and this is a this is a study that was done by Diego Correa in Harvard 
he started trying to figure out which was which one was the best and there's a lot of argument about which it's if it's better to do intravenous and lung entrapment and so on and he said what he did was he burnt the hit leg of one of the rats and he injected the labeled cells through the tail vein and if you can see day zero they're all focused in the lungs and then three weeks later there was nothing left around then in the other rat he did the same burn but he de uh, deployed the cells through the aortic arch in the week three the cells were still there <coughs> in the burn so that tells you that they do get trapped in the lungs um, the percentage is uh, debatable but they do get trapped in the lung and liver and spleen in different uh, percentages so every time we can do a direct deployment is ideal rather than, than doing an intravenous injection so what I was telling you about a framework and if, if you can put two and two together then it's worth trying it like for example you have articular destruction in, the, uh, in an osteoarthritis you have um, extracellular matrix degradation you have chondrocytes that are non-functioning and the local MSCs are non-functioning either, either and um, they cannot differentiate it impairs the differentiation and in, instead of differentiating into cartilage they start differentiating into bone which is a bad idea in a joint and then you have cells that are highly anti-inflammatory and they have trophic effects uh, to the local cells so then it makes a lot of sense to use a cellular product for an osteoarticular condition uh, these are some papers pretty recent that this was a comprehensive review on intraarticular injections of um, culture expanded mesenchymal cells and they found that six months after the injection in, in the high percentage of the, case, of the cases there was growth of highline cartilage and like I always say if the patient comes to you with diminished decreased range of motion and pain in a joint and you do a, a cellular therapy, you do an, a, a, an injection, intraarterial inter injection. And 15 days later, the patient is in no pain. And then six months later, you do an MRI and there's no changes in the MRI. Is it a successful treatment or not? Of course it is. The patient is, was in pain and he's in no pain no more. So it, for, for documentation purposes, we use also that you can actually uh, get a number, result in numbers. So it, it feeds as a, as a documentation and scientific data too. Anyway, what we do is, like I said, we do the patient, the consultation we highly recommend to have an MRI for diagnosis to know what else is in there to know what else is going on on a joint and soft tissue and then we give them an analog scale of pain and we give them a, a questionnaire specific for the joint we're going to treat and then we do the intraarticular uh, injection or in the ligament, muscle, tendon, whatever um, using for soft tissue the ideal ideal is to use uh, radiological guidance, ultrasound to actually inject the cells where the tear is and <clears throat> we use a 3 ml syringe and a 25 one and a half needle we just do inject like you would inject I don't know a steroid in the joint it's important not to mix it okay 
This is what we're supposed to say. You do not mix this product with anything else. That's not saline. I do. I mix it with PRP. I could probably do some hyaluronic acid. I could probably get some fibrin gel and inject it in the joint. That's what makes sense clinically and biologically, even if it doesn't, and if it's not allowed regulatory wise. And then we do follow ups three and six months after the injections. But the page, we keep the patients doing, filling out those questionnaires because those questionnaires will give you a time frame and you can actually say, okay, this patient got better within the first month. Oh, this patient took longer, it took him three months or whatever. So you kind of gauge um, and then you know what to expect in several, in, in similar cases. Uh, this is me. This is my MRI before and after. And this was bone marrow aspirate. It was a meniscal tear. This uh, MRI I had to beg Dr. Joseph Burita in Boca Raton to finally give me the pictures. And Zumba accident. <laughs> And then six months later, I, I mean, within, within the first month, I was pain-free. And it was autologous bone marrow, but then we're, we were talking about a 45-year-old woman with no other condition. So, that was a few years ago. Um, this is one of the, it's in Spanish because this is from from our Cancun hospital. Um, we had an vascular necrosis, but we did, we were working with, uh, with this doctor that's, he's a guru of, um, they call it orthomolecular medicine, and he does all this um, chelations and vitamin supplementations and mineral supplementation, hormone replacement, and so on. So we kind of put the patient in uh, high doses, high dose vitamin C and uh, minerals and so on, and then we did. The in he did the intra intraosseal injection. And now in aesthetics, um, the most in 2008, Dr. Kotaro Yoshimura. He was, he was the first one coming up with this idea of assisting the, assisting the fat transfer with uh, cells. And he did it with vascular, um, uh, stromovascular fraction from adipose tissue. And he published two trials. One of them, uh, it was six patients with Paris Romberg syndrome, full lipodystrophy in the face. And, um, a year later, the implants were there alive and uh, it was successful. Normally, there is data, there is, a, there, there is a paper by a plastic surgeon, uh, Fournier, I think is his name. Uh, he claims that 40% of the fat injected is, it disappears within the, the first three months. So this guy just proved that if you assist the fat transfer with stem cells, with stem cells, with cellular therapies, uh, the, the uh, injected fat will, will last way longer. Um, and why is that? Because basically fat gets eaten by macrophages. And then fat is a very, it's a tissue that's very dependent on um, irrigation, blood irrigation. And then you have cells that are capable of immunomodulate, decrease their macrophages activity, and release growth factors, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor that's going to create new circulation, boom. There you go. So he published those uh, studies. I believe you have some, no, you don't, but if I'm gonna give you my email, I can send you, if you're interested in that, I can send you those papers. And he actually was one of the first guys that published a, a clinical trial using autologous uh, stromovascular fraction. 
<laughs> so this is how we do it. Pictures, pictures, pictures. People, is there some plastic and or aesthetic guy or people tend to forget how they look before. And if you don't show them a picture, dude, look at you before. They they claim <laughs> no, I did I did well by you. So anyway, pictures and then we evaluate how much we're going to inject. And then we got a 30 mil do 10 if you're injecting uh, a little less. You could do a 10 mil vial. But normally in a phase you do about 30, 40 milliliters of fat, so it's good to have a lot of cells in there for it to last longer. And uh, we mix Basically, if you have 40, 40, 40 mils of adipose, solid adipose tissue, you might dilute the 30 mil vial in 5 or 7 ml of normal saline and then mix it with the um, tissue that you're going to inject. And then we do the injection using a blunt cannula in layers, placing 0 0.2, 0 0.5 of the mix in a retrograde injection. And then we do follow up three months with PRP. This is one of our nurses in, in Cancun. He's actually the head nurse, pain in the butt. But she has lupus and she had um, paniculitis, so she lost half her face. This has been, uh, right now I have to take a new picture because she's been three years already. And now she's fat and she's really cheeky. This is another one day, uh, Dr. Bahia did a, a subsession after and then injected uh, umbilical cord blood product. And that was six months later. And this one, I'm so happy. This I did this. Um, it, this uh, this is another nurse that had this horrible scar, and uh, this was one month. And then we did an injection. Uh, in reality, what we did was culture expanded MSCs local in there. And she's still happy and okay because it kind of improved significantly. Alopecia, well, there, there are um, conflicting reports and there is not a paper that follows up an alopecia patient for more than a year and a half, two years. Um, everything that I have read it follows up for about six months, but then if you're use, if you're talking about androgenetic alopecia or estrogenic alopecia, you're fighting hormones and genetics. So that means, yes, it it helps. There is growth of of hair. It's a very weak hair, but it grows. Uh, now these guys with this androgenic alopecia and we need to keep on treating them because that hair is going to fall eventually too. So now what they're doing in Colombia is they're assisting the hair transplant with the stem cells and they have, it's, it's scary because they, normally they report about 40% loss of the hair follicles and now they're reporting a 10% loss. So they stay there. Now, when we're talking alopecia areata, it's the patchy alopecia, not the totalis, the totalis that we haven't seen ever any result. And this is what's cool. This is, uh, I saw this, this paper on, on hair loss. And the funny thing, in the bulge, the cells of the bulge are the responsible for taking the hair through all the phases of growth. And if you see, those are stem cells that they're, they're lighting up for CD34. So these are stem cells and for some reason they get inhibited by chemical changes, by hormone change and for, by autoimmune uh, situations like in the 
alopecia areata. And then you're putting immunomodulatory and trophic cells in there. It just wakes them up. And this is how we do it. We don't go through life painting people's heads like that for purposes. Um, so it's important to have data, have a baseline on the patient before. So complete blood count, uh, androgen biomarkers, um, we do the Ludwig scale and you have that in the book. The Ludwig scale for females and the Norwood scale for males. A whole uh, hormonal panel and then if you have the the instrument you can do a trichoscopy or the hair pull, hair pull test and all that is documented before and then we use a 30 gauge needle to administer in, in this case you can go and use probably 10 mil if, the, if there is a small area and dilute it in about 3 ml so that you have enough and then we'll do 0.1 of the cell mixed every square centimeter There's no problem with using small gauge needles. Um, 30 gauge needle is okay. We just not uh, put extra pressure on the syringe. We had that argument with, uh, with uh, Ernesto one day and then Rafael measured. He found the inner diameter of the 30 gauge needle and he did all the calculations. So we ended up like, okay, we're gonna use 30. And then I was like, can I use a 32? He was like, you're not going to make me do this again. <laughs> no, I did it for the 30. You're good with the 30. What, what happens when you apply some pressure? Is it hurt the cell? The shear and the, the, the pressure, um, you get, because they can clump, and if you start pushing it, you can actually produce some damage. So if you do it slowly, they just flow. And it's important to use it to do it with a 1 ml syringe because if you're using a 3 ml, you're just putting more pressure through a, through a 30 gauge needle. I should have taken the volume off my computer. Anyway, this is one patient. Normally what we do is we do the first treatment and then we follow up with three PRPs. Uh, one a month. Oh, that we do one treatment with a cellular product and then we follow up with three PRPs within How long would it take? Like, like, this was two months later. No, 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 that means... Oh, injecting? Yeah. How? Like, Time-wise. Time-wise. Like, like is, is it in there for an hour, two hours? Oh, no. The, inject, the injection process? Yeah. About 20 minutes. It depends on how bald the person is, <laughs> how, how big is the area. But no, no, it doesn't take a long time at all. It's pretty easy and quick. We just is it much easy for the bald area? Is it no, um, I mean, you should get probably a 10 mil vial and add about two more ml of uh, saline so that you have more more volume to cover the whole area but then what I was saying is that it's better if you use one ml syringes because you don't put a lot of pressure the it just goes in easier so 10 million cells is enough for a head like that I like to use 30 but you could go for I think 30 is the number then erectile dysfunction it's a uh, in 60% of the patients with erectile dysfunction, and then this is a condition that affects a very high percentage of men uh, internationally, uh, more, more than, than we imagine. But 60% of them, the etiology is related to small vessel vascular disease. So then we figured that we have a product that has cells that can repair endothelium and can create new vasculature. So this should work, right? Well, it works if there is actual endothelial damage or there is a damage to the pudendal nerve post-prostatectomy 
it works um, and some people some people are are in need of several more treatments but it does work now if the patient has a venous valve insufficiency it does it will not work uh, we a couple of years ago we um, did a pilot study with a urologist down in Miami and um, we were using bone marrow and we were taking everybody in like anybody that wanted to be we wanted 20 patients then we realized after three months that the patients that had um, venous valve insufficiency did not have any results and then he was like damn of course not you know veins don't have endothelium veins, veins we're not going to fix this this is a physical issue and they need micro surgery or uh, the old implant so basically what we put on the protocol is we have to do a penile doppler before because that's going to tell us the percentage of venous leak that this patient has uh, and the percentage of the volume, the volume that's getting in. So that's going to help us make uh, an informed decision uh, whether we're going to treat this patient or not. So we use the International Erectile Dysfunction Index um, Questionnaire. You have it there too in your book of protocols. And we have this patient doing it before, uh, along with the abdominal panel and so on. And then we have them do once a month and send it to us. And then uh, three months down the road, we do another Doppler. And six months down the road, we do another Doppler. And then we figure out, okay, we're going to treat them again. What are we going to do with this? How happy um, is this patient with the percentage of improvement and so on? So injection injection in the corpus cavernosum is actually simpler than it sounds because if you go on the laterals, if you have the let me if you have the urethra facing front and you pull it and you go on the sides with a 27 uh, half an inch needle, there is nowhere to be but in the corpus cavernosum. It's nothing, it's very, it's pretty uh, much a simple uh, procedure. And then the follow up, like I said, we do three and six months. This is a video, let me see if it plays, I'm not sure that, oh yeah, it does. Guys, relax. Yeah. Relax. Is that, is that a now, this, believe it or not, this patient is filming his own procedure. I don't know that we. <laughs> He's my IT guy. Let me see. No, it just it doesn't have. <laughs> the problem is that um, on him, he's um, he's one of those geeky millennials that are ra have been raised to never be happy with what they have, and he got this wonderful idea of purchasing Metacryl from Canada. Metacryl is a type of silicone that they use a lot for. Um, they used to use it for um, facial injections and so on as a filler. And this idiot got the Metacryl and he injected himself because he wanted to increase girth. Injected what? Metacryl. It's uh, plastic. It's like what they pull on the windshields of the cars that they don't powder like that, that's Metacryl. But there are products, they used, there used to be a product here in the U.S. that was collagen and Metacryl. What was that? Artifil? Article? Article. 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 
huh? Oh, it is still in existence. It's so, it is exactly, and it is pretty similar. But the thing is that I don't know what type of metacryl he got. So one day, one day he comes to me and he goes like, Doc, uh, when I get an erection, there is nothing. The glands, it's not getting hard, and I have a whole bunch of little bumps. And I'm like, really? Oh, you're lucky. You're lucky that you still get an erection. Because all that thing traveled, and then we did the injections around. Because you could touch and you could feel the little beads of product. Now I want this to shut up. Like he's talking to me, I'm filming. How did I do that? Let me, let me just. What, what product are you injecting there? Bomaro. Now, one question. You mentioned um, uh, the fetal nerve damage after prostatectomies. So, do stem cell injections help for that? And where do y'all inject them? Right there, intra intracavernous. Okay. Now, this is how we do it. We do a, um, we use a tourniquet in the base of the penis, and we leave it for about 30 seconds to create hypoxia and create enough signaling for the cells to stick in there. Um, and then we do an injection on each side. You could do only one side because the cavernous uh, communicate with each other, but it's better if we do one on each side. And then we leave the tourniquet in for about another 20 seconds and then we release. Now, how you could do a lidocaine injection on the skin, but we were talking about uh, how damaging the lidocaine could be with the cells. So what I do is I get a compounded BLT cream and it has high dose of benzocaine, lidocaine, tetracaine. So I tell the guy, I give him a cellophane, um, uh, saran wrap or a condom. God, that's an awesome idea. You can call the doctor H. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you credit for that. <laughs> I never, I wow, yeah. So anyway, yeah, I, I saran wrap is cheaper though. Anyway, I give him a piece of saran wrap and I, I hand him a. a a bit of that cream, so I tell them, just go, uh, cover your penis with this, cover it with a, with a saran wrap, and sit out there for about 20 minutes, half an hour. And then I do the injection, and this guy was, this, and, and normally the intracavernous injection is very straightforward. I was going at it on this guy, and he was just still filming, chatting, he was okay, it, there's no pain. Of course, I don't have one of those, so I wouldn't be able to say it. In the PRP procedure, what we do basically, we give it lidocaine like here. Kind of like to, to do a block. Well, that's to block it. And yeah. We do the injection. Yeah. That's also, you will have to tell me exactly where it is so I can try. Sure. <laughs> that's another, yeah. Because if you put if you put the lidocaine in there, it's gonna touch the cells, and it might be that nothing happens, but it might be that it damages them. And you don't want that. So these are the, all this uh, literature you have in there on your book of of, uh, of papers. But this is a review of all the trials in humans because. There's a lot of trials in rabbits and, and rats. In humans, there's not that many. Uh, so I kind of got this one that mentions them all. But are those are, the results are very, very stimulating, very, very stimulating, so to speak. Wound care. And let's go back to the framework. If you have a chronic wound, you have inflammation, you have low mitogenic activity, you have uh, excess metalloproteinase, um, a lot of uh, ECM.
use angiogenesis, cell senescence, and disaster altogether. And this is some of the data <coughs> that I gather on the, one of those wound care um, journals. Worldwide, the wound care market is projected to surpass $22 billion by next year. In the U.S., we spend $10 billion a year to treat chronic wounds. So we need to try to help, our, because obviously you're, if you were spending $10 billion and you had a rate of success of 90%, let's go ahead and do it, but then we don't have success. We're not treating wounds uh, well. We don't, we, we're not getting spectacular results that compare to the amount of money that we're spending. So what we do is we do a surgical debridement and then we inject 30 million uh, diluted in uh, 3 ml according to the size of the wound in the borders and the wound bed. Now this is uh, one of those treatments that I can guarantee you for sure that is going to be a multi-dose treatment. This is not something that you're not going to close a chronic wound with only one injection in three months. That's not, that doesn't happen. I mean, you will, the wound will get significantly better, but going as far as solving the whole take a lot of treatments. And you can mix, you can mix it up. If you have, um, you have other options for treatment, not only um, the, the cellular product in a vial, you could do a bone marrow, you could do PRP, you could do SBF, you can do some amniotic in there. You can throw stuff in the mix just to keep the regeneration process going. Basically, patient consultation, informed consent, measure of the wound. And then, like I said, surgical, surgical debridement or preferably sur surgical debridement, not chemical debridement. And then 30 million cells. And normally we repeat it in a month or at least two months. And this is a concept of multi-dosing. Injecting and injecting and injecting. This lady got everything. This lady got everything possible. She had SVF, she had marrow, she had PRP, she had uh, her own culture expanded cells injected. And so do, you, do you all use hyperbaric oxygen? Yes. Okay. Well, um, in, in Cancun is a diverse um, oh, yeah. area. So at the hospital that we work, they have a good hyperbaric chamber. So if the patient has the time, we recommend sessions after. So are you all at all concerned about the neonatal literature about you know the effects of hyperoxia on neonates? And I mean I'm a little concerned about putting these, you know, neonates? Well yeah, because in the NICU you've got premature baby, you can't keep them on high high levels of oxygen, they'll go blind. Among other things Oh, okay. Does that on adults? No, but we're using baby cells essentially. We're using the same age of cells. Yeah, but the damage, the damage that the, that hyperoxia is producing is a localized damage to the cells of the uh, cornea. No, I'm worried about the stem cells we're injecting. Those cells. But you don't do, you don't expose those cells to hyperbaric at all. You do the hyperbarics before, or and after. No, you don't do it at the same day. Okay, so this is day 60. And, but that was a lot of work. But it was worth it. And this is this as um, uh, radiation necrotic uh, necrosis. Um, this patient had an osteosarcoma and was irradiated. They did even an, a skin graft that didn't take at all. And um, 
this this picture is courtesy of what used to be BioHeart, and they treated her with SBF. And so this the second picture is seven months later. It should have been closed, but the the level of DNA damage that radiation produces, this type of wounds, you think they're epithelizing and they they open up again and it goes like so they kept it for seven months pretty decent. So the follow-up, again, three months with photographs and planimetry and so on, um, and six months. In six months, we should have a significant result already. Now, when we're talking about COPD ears, um, and COPD ears is pretty uh, decently simple because it's an IV injection. Normally we use, um, we do the complete uh, workup of the patient using also CT scan or MRI of the lung and PFTs and um, C-reactive protein and such. Important, the six minute walking distance test. And, and that is the test where I have seen most results, more exciting uh, results. I mean, they have, my patients have increased about 20% the walking distance after an infusion. And then if we were talking about cells getting trapped in the lungs, hey, that's what we want. IV, everything you put IV, the first pass is in the lung. So we use, once we got, when we're gonna do an, a systemic injection, we have to premedicate the patient. And this is the premedication combination that we use. We do this an hour before the application. Benadryl 25 uh, milligrams, Santac 200 milligrams, and Solumedrol 125 IV, single dose. And then we wait and we give them the IV. Now we do one million cells per kg of body weight um, in two doses. One month, one month apart. If there is a uh, pulmonologist here, whatever, or you can get somebody to do the intrabronchial installation, it would be wonderful. And then the patient, we recommend also a pulmonary rehab program afterwards. So the follow-up goes three months and six months. Now, uh, autoimmune disorders, basically. Can you use nebulizer to break cells? Um, I, I'm sorry. Can you use a nebulizer machine to aerosolize and break cells? I, um, I don't see everything that you aerosolize, you kind of pulverize. So you're breaking cells. And number one, and number two, uh, the anything that you are also like normally stays in the oropharynx, so it's really hard for them to actually get down there. So you're better off either insulating them directly to the lungs or doing an IV. Now rheumatoid arthritis is the, the one that we treat it mo that we treat the most, and what we do is also use 30 millions. Um, I mean, two, two million per kg of body weight, and, and we get the vials of 30 million. And we're following up with uh, specific uh, questionnaires for arthritis, three at six months. Now, when it comes to neurodegenerative disorders, I. It, can, I can I ask you a question about the um, inflammatory? Uh, what is the also approach to the immune modulators with them? Do you try to get them off of it, or do you say? I I don't I don't tell them to get off of them, but I just tell them to uh, follow up with the rheumatologist to the point where if there is an improvement uh, symptom in symptoms and. Uh, changes in the lab work just to start reducing the dose and taking them off of prednisone or uh, tumor necrosis factor inhibitor especially. Do you find um, therapeutic response with patients or all those medications? Not, 
I have I have found that when they're in chronic prednisone, they don't respond as well. If they're only on uh, tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, they do much much. Methotrexate, I always have, uh, and normally they combine the methotrexate with a with a tumor necrosis factor inhibitor. So it's kind of I'm not really happy when they have methotrexate. But definitely the prednisone, I try, I even try to talk to their rheumatologists, see if they can wean them off before the treatment. Because it's not that you're doing a solumedrol. This is a patient that's been a year in prednisone. So the immune uh, system is not working definitely correctly. So anyway, what I, what, what I was saying about the neurodegenerative conditions, um, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, we have seen better results in early, uh, younger, early diagnosed Parkinson's disease. But the reality is that the results are pretty frustrating because they're not long lasting as we expect them to be. The way we do it, and that's the, the, the program we figure um, we're gonna bypass the lungs, so we do a catheterization to the carotid arteries or even further up. Um, and once we're there, we do a small dose of mannitol, and then we deploy the cells that combined with an intrathecal injection also. Uh, we use a two million cell per kg of body weight. You could do if um, there is a guy uh, in Spain that does stereotactic delivery, but then here's the neurosurgeon. Um, intravenous route has been not that uh, all, all that successful. The best results we have seen have been with a combination of uh, arterial cath and intrathecal. Now this is neurodegenerative. When you're talking about um, stroke, the younger the stroke, the best results. And the younger the patient, the bestest results. But we need to catch them early. Within the first 15 days is the ideal situation. It, com it becomes complicated, um, but if if we can do a, an intraarterial delivery within 15 days of the stroke, the patients are very, respond very, very, very well. Are you seeing any high fevers as a result of the injections? No, headaches but no high fevers at all. And even that, I have seen a lot of uh, flu-like symptoms with IV, but not with intraarterial. Maybe because the patient is heavily medicated anyway with the anesthesia and the whole. So this is our little um, team in Cancun. Um, and this is the autism program and uh, we, like I said, we get the kids, with they, they get a, a neurology evaluation and they get a critical care pediatrics evaluation and so on. And then we do catheterization with mannitol and uh, intrathecal injection. So he tries to go, I don't do that, that's Dr. Roberto Geronimo. A little bit of a genius, I'm the badass. So this is Federica, I, I, unfortunately I, this is a, a girl from Uruguay that came to us and uh, we did Autologous BMAC and culture expanded MSC, allergenic culture expanded MSC, one million per uh, kilo of body weight, intrathecally and cash. And this is a video of her, one hour, 30 minutes. She wouldn't stop talking, it was crazy. 
And we didn't film her before because we were not expecting this. But she was no eye contact and no nonverbal in front of unfamiliar adults. How long did this last? Huh? This she she winded down within about ten days, but still she kept she still we we're still in contact with them. This is an Uruguayan family and they uh, she even came out in the news, uh, newspaper and so on. Um, because this girl, this, this was about six months ago and this girl has progressed tremendously. And this hyperverbalization lasted for about a week and then she went again. But then she was friendlier with unfamiliar people and she was keeping eye contact which was very, this was like one of those things that you think, oh my god, seriously? Is this not witchcraft? We were not expecting this level of. What was that? Administration of that child? Uh, Intraterial and intrathecal. And the two million was divided? Yes. 50 /50? Yes. So this was an MS patient. Where, where do you do the intra-arterial? Where? Yeah, where do you go in? Oh, it's femoral. So, you see he's getting there. Do you just inject it at the femoral artery or do you... No, 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 this is the... Yeah, it's very Fashion. So you see that he started at he started at the femoral artery and he went up there. And then that's the same patient. We did the cath administration and then um, we did the intrathecal. And this is our dream team. Dr. Roberto Geronimo, she's our anesthesiologist and yours truly. So anyway, uh, this is a very, very exciting thing that we're involved with right now and it, it's like it brings a smile to my face every time I talk about it. Um, a group uh, in the uh, Angeles del Carmen Hospital in Guadalajara, they, it's a group that does IVF and fertility and all sorts. And this lady, she's badass. I'm trying to get her to write uh, protocols for uh, UIN for, for us. Um, she decided that she was going to, tr uh, to try and treat idiopathic premature ovarian failure. And she got treated well, I went there and we treated four patients and he injected directly in the ovaries through laparos laparoscopy and recently she presented, this was like three months ago, four months ago, and she presented the results already and she, one of the patients, she has three eggs already frozen ready to make her a mom. And this is the intraovarian injection. That's being injected where? In the ovary. The ovary is pretty um, atrophic, so it's hard to, it was hard to put it in, but. So that's like, that's, we're all like all uh, excited. Did they do the genetic testing on the baby? What baby? She had a baby, right? No, 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 no. She had a, a premature ovarian failure. This is a 24... I thought she said something about baby after this with Eggs. The ovary, she had uh, three eggs and they pulled them out and they have them frozen to do the IVF. To give her a baby. So they, they treated her, then they did a follow-up, then they did a stimulation protocol, and they did 
And if the energy was laparoscopically or transvaginally? Just vaginally. Hey, uh, uh, did they try this case and the artisan? Did they try the regular IV or they went straight to this? A lot of people do regular IV. Does, and does it work or? No, I, I'll tell you something. I have, I have talked to doctors that do only IV for autism and they report that kids um, in, improve in, in um, cord hand eye, co eye coordination, they decrease the uh, movement, pathological movements, and they improve a little bit on the contact. So, is that also age dependent? It the is. The earlier you do it, the better. Yeah. It is. So cost-wise, you know, we cannot expand cell lines here, so we're buy every time. Cost-wise, does it make sense to do an intratecal, like one-time intratecal for autism kid versus doing a multiple IV if you can solve some of the That's a good question. Uh, obviously, it cost-wise is going to be. I don't. I don't know the difference between how how is this patient going to do with several treatments in once a month, six treatments versus one treatment intrathecal. That will be something to, to look into. But cost-wise, obviously, it's going to be cheaper to do it one time intrathecally than do several IVs because every time you're going to do an IV, you're going to have to purchase them. So I'm going to finish with uh, something that the late first lady Nancy Reagan said and she was talking about embryonic but visionary as she was uh, we have in our hands hope about embryonic stem cell research but cellular therapies are hope for a lot of conditions and like I said I expect I expect it to be the future where we don't have those long lines for organ transplant. But because we're going to be able to repair our own. And it really, the problem is that regulators are, makes us waste so much time. And uh, at the end of the day, we're not solving problems or we're not figuring out that this work or this doesn't definitely work and and thank God in the rest of the world you can do things usually the every big jump in the in the progression of the medicines and the medicine and, and treatments and surgeries and some procedures have been done from a doctor's office not from a big pharmaceutical company. So this is my email and phone number if you all wanted to contact me.